Hello students, greetings and welcome and uh, we are at lecture number 8 now and we are doing the second chapter, the second story in your book Flamingo and uh, it's called Lost Spring. Before we move further into what is there in Lost Spring, uh, let's focus a little bit on the title of the story. Like uh, when we were doing my mother at 66, I told you that winter in literature is symbolic of death, decay, old age. Like when we say someone is in the winter of their life, what we mean to say in reality is that that person is decaying, that person is undergoing degeneration, that person is old, that person is very old, is withered, is wrinkled. Uh, if winter is symbolic of uh, old age, then what spring can be symbolic of? Spring has two symbolic meanings here. One is that it is a direct representative, direct symbol of childhood, youth. And uh, it is also symbolic of joys in life. It's symbolic of brightness, joys, happiness. So this is lost spring that is lost childhood. See, the stories that you have in your textbook, many of them, many poems and many stories are excerpts, are extracts. They are not complete stories. They are not full books. In CBSE, you have more of extracts from la longer books. This is also a book. Uh, Lost Spring, Stories of Stolen Childhood is a book by a writer called Anis Jung. And you have been given some parts of that story some parts of that longer book of various stories. So two stories have been chosen for your syllabus and they are about two children and they are about a lot of other children like them but the central characters of these two stories, one is Sahib Alam and one is Mukesh. So we are doing Sahib Alam's story first and then we will move on to Mukesh's story. But uh, the book has been subtitled, the story has been subtitled Stories of Stolen Childhood. So this is lost spring, lost childhood, lost joys in life, lost happiness in life, lost joys related to childhood and these are all stories of stolen childhood. These are stories of stolen childhood. What, what do you mean by stolen childhood? Stolen childhood is uh, childhood lost basically, childhood that's not theirs. They don't have a right on their childhood. Why do these children not have a right on their childhood? We are talking of very poor children here. Mukesh and Sahib Alam are not children like you who have access to good education, good facilities, who can be sitting in air conditioned rooms and be provided by their parents. They are not like you and I. They come from uh, poverty stricken backgrounds and you know this thing that we have a lot of inequality in our country. We have a lot of uh, economic disparity. In fact, a lot of your syllabus is trying to tell you the same thing that there can be inequalities in the world and in India we have a lot of inequality, we have a lot of unfairness because somebody is so rich that they are eating pizza all the time, ordering or, or you know on Zomato and Swiggy but there is somebody who cannot even make ends meet. So we live, in a, we live in a country like that, we are a society where the economic disparities are just too many. And also, uh, it's not, see, it's not that only India has economic disparity, there can be disparities in other countries as well. For instance, you did the poem, an elementary school classroom in a slum, where you saw that uh, the poet is talking about a society in general. He is not specifically talking about any particular society. So there are societies across the world that uh, have economic disparities. But in our own country also we see those uh, disparities. So Anis Jang is a very talented uh, writer and she has written this book called Stories of uh, Stolen Childhood. And uh, in this there are many stories of uh, childhood lost of poor children who are undergoing things, who are undergoing troubles in life because they come from families which are very poor, who are very poor. So these, the, you have two stories. First is Sahib Alam's story and the second is Mukesh's story. Alright, so let's read a little bit about the writer first. 
and uh, like I always say, please open your textbook, keep the textbook right in front of you so that you can take down notes or else open the PDF on your computer and keep taking down notes, keep writing down meanings because it is important. They might just ask you something from the like, they might give you a line from the chapter, from the story and you will have to answer an MCQ or a short answer type question or whatever. So you should be prepared and you should know the meaning, the underlying meaning of each and every sentence, especially in chapters like these where something is being said, but there, there are, there is an underlying meaning, there is an undercurrent to that thing. So please keep taking notes. Anis Jung was born in Raurkela and spent her childhood and adolescence in Hyderabad. And she also received her education in the United States of America. She went to the University of Michigan to receive her education in uh, America. Her parents were both writers. Her father was also a very well known writer. Anis Jung began her career as a writer in India. She has been an editor and columnist for major newspapers in India and abroad and has authored several books. The following is an excerpt. The stories given to you are excerpts, are parts of her book titled Lost Springs Stories of Stolen Childhood. Here, Anis Jung analyzes the grinding poverty, the extreme poverty that can trouble your life completely and traditions which condemn these children to a life of exploitation. It is their poverty which renders them so helpless that they are, uh, they they are bound to, they are forced to live a life of exploitation. Exploitation becomes a part and parcel of someone's life when that person is very poor. See, uh, you cannot be exploited for instance. You cannot be exploited because you know your parents are there to provide for you. What if your parents were not there to provide for you? What if you had to scrounge for uh, food every day? What, what if you had to look for food every day? What if you did not go to work? Uh, at a tea stall or at a you know at any small shop if you did not go to work you did not get get the day's earnings and you could not buy food for yourself and your family so they live in they live day to day they don't live uh, with larger plans actually i always feel that plans are for rich people plans are for uh, middle class for upper middle class and rich people in india the poor people cannot have plans plans are also a luxury that uh, only few people can afford for themselves because we keep planning. Okay, I'll attempt the exams and then I will go for a holiday. Okay, I will study in the day, then in the evening I might watch a movie on Netflix. Or um, if I do this, my parents are going to buy me a new phone or a new watch or I might have a dinner at my favorite place. All of these are plans that are uh, affordable. All of these are... Uh, you know, things that you can afford only because you have the money with you. These children do not come from backgrounds where there is this facility is available to them. This luxury is available to them. So they are forced to live a life of exploitation. Anybody can behave any way with them. They do not uh, have that kind of uh, freedom. They don't have the kind of, you know, facilities and the kind of uh, basic things. If your basic things are not given to you, obviously, you are constantly struggling in life and poverty is that kind of a back breaking, uh, you know, a thing which is which can become a curse in your life. This story is titled here like sometimes I find a rupee in the garbage. So we are talking about uh, rag picker children in this particular story in the first part that we are doing in this lecture. It is Sahib Alam's story and uh, we are talking about rag pickers. Rag pickers are children who pick rags. Pick rags as in, they are uh, constantly collecting garbage. You must have seen them around railway platforms also at some point or the other in your life. They are shooed away most of the time, but uh, these children are constantly collecting things from the garbage. What do they do with those things? Sometimes they are collecting plastic bottles. So they sell them somewhere. Uh, they might get other things as well. It's not just plastic bottles. They get a lot of other things from the garbage. And sometimes there is always a chance of finding a rupee in the garbage. By mistake, somebody has thrown money into the garbage. So they might find one rupee. A one rupee coin is a huge happiness to a child who is a rag picker who uh, just collects garbage. So all of these uh, children, 
they start their day early morning and they constantly pick rags they constantly pick garbage and they you know they they like an army of barefoot boys they they keep roaming the streets barefoot in every city collecting garbage and selling things that can be sold so that they can earn some money for themselves and their families so here the writer anis jung is having conversation with the children in this part of the story and in the next part of the story which we'll do in the next lecture in both of these stories you would see that the author is talking directly to the children so what you presented here is a conversation she's talking to sahib e alam she's talking to this child who's a rag picker and she's talking to other children like himself he is the hero of this particular story but uh, there are several other children that she is talking about why are showing us one person sometimes i find a rupee in the garbage why do you do this i ask sahib i ask i here is anish jung i ask sahib whom i encounter every morning scrounging scrounging means looking for searching for gold in the garbage dumps of my neighborhood what do you mean by looking for gold please pay attention she sees sahib e alam every day scrounging looking for gold is he getting gold in the garbage is there any possibility of getting gold in the garbage no he is not looking for gold gold here means his source of livelihood gold here is a treasure that he finds in the garbage the treasure that gets him his livelihood so he is constantly looking for something that can be valuable that can be sold so that he can buy his uh, livelihood that so that he can get his livelihood for himself so he is constantly scrounging for gold in the garbage dumps of my neighborhood so this boy and many other boys like him come to the author's neighborhood and they are that's that's where they meet that's where she gets chatty with them that's where she starts talking with them sahib left his home long ago set amidst the green fields of dhaka his home is not even a distant memory there were many storms that swept away their fields and homes his mother tells him that's why they left looking for gold in the big city where he now lives so in the same paragraph you might note you might have noticed that the word gold has been used twice so that you don't misunderstand i guess uh, there is no confusion here gold is a reference to livelihood gold is a reference to livelihood it means your source of income he does not come from india this guy is not indian he and his family and many other families like sahib's family they live on the outskirts of delhi in a place called simapuri and all of these rag pickers they came to india looking for gold looking for livelihood they are illegal immigrants in the country in our country they are illegal immigrants and they left their home they left their home this is there is a reference of a place called dhaka it's in bangladesh so they left their green fields of dhaka because they were rendered helpless there they were not able to make ends meet they were not able to have employment they were not able to get food for their children so this is why all of these people together they migrated to india they are illegal immigrants in the country so gold is a reference to livelihood as i told you as i specified and dhaka is their home dhaka is their actual home they are living illegally in india they are illegal immigrants to the country so she gets chatty with them she gets talking with them which is why she which is how she gets a lot of information about these children and their families i have nothing else to do he mutters looking away when she asks sahib e alam what do you, why do you do this why are you constantly collecting rags he replies i have nothing else to do what what else do i do if i don't do this uh what what else should i do go to school i say glibly without thinking without much prior thought the author suggests that uh, you should go to school 
that glibly please note down glibly means without thinking very smoothly very easily without thinking about it at all the writer says uh, why don't you go to school please attend a school why are you collecting garbage Re realizing immediately how hollow the advice must sound but immediately after saying this the writer realizes that her advice is completely hollow it's a useless advice it's a useless advice to a boy like sahib alam see it's like uh, it's it's very uh, sometimes we don't realize how insensitive we are becoming when we are talking to poor people like you might just find a beggar child on the road and you immediately say to the child why don't you go to school you are just lecturing a child without even realizing that the child comes from a background where it is just not nobody is even thinking about the child's education he has no school to go to there is no school in his neighborhood he says there is no school in my neighborhood when they build one when they build a school i will go again without thinking again without thinking properly without giving proper thought the author says if i start a school will you come sahib will you come to my school if i build a school if there is no a school in your neighborhood would you like to come to my school yes he says smiling broadly he says that of course he would come very uh, you know he will come he be eager to attend the school if the author built a school for him but the point is that the author was not he she did not she may have understood the plight of these children but here she was not completely serious she just half jokingly said that if i build a school will you come to my school but in reality she is no school she does not have a school of her own or she she has not yet built a school to which sahib can be a in which sahib can be a student he says smiling broadly that yes i will come definitely come a few days later i see him running up to me <laughs> is your school ready he says oh you did not mean the promise but the child has taken you very seriously he says is your school ready he sees the author again and says is your school ready can i attend the school now it takes longer to build a school she replies but she is embarrassed the author is very embarrassed she she realizes that she made a promise that she did not mean embarrassed at having made a promise that was not meant but promises like mine abound in every corner of his bleak world bleak here is a reference to unhappiness the dullness of his life the unhappiness of his life the lack of shine and brightness in his life it's a bleak dull world he comes from a bleak world and this line is very important here please note down its meaning the author is embarrassed that she made a promise that she did not sincerely mean she was just joking that she was building a school when she gets embarrassed she realizes that it's not only me who is breaking the promises i just uh, promised the child something as a joke he has taken it seriously saib alam has taken my promises promise seriously but it's not only my promise that has been broken there are several other people promising the the poor in every country so many things but those promises are never fulfilled who are those people who are making these promises to the children there are the, pol the the politicians of the area the local politicians the ngos everybody is saying something or the other to these children the rich people sometimes they also promise something to the children or for once you know they get into the formality of like donating something to these children but in reality nobody takes their responsibility they were starving in their country which is why they had to move to india india has its own poor india has india as a country is a country with a lot of poor people already so nobody takes responsibility of these people at all they are you know they are just given false promises all the time that they they would be taken care of that they would be given employment they would be given an identity they would be given some source of income but nothing of that sort ever happens they are rendered helpless most of the time so she realizes but promises like mine abound in every corner of his bleak world is his unhappy world is full of promises like the one that i just made after months of knowing him i ask him his name she has been talking to this child for a long time now 
but you know sometimes you start talking to a person without ever uh, asking them their name it happens it happens with me also a lot of times that i have had a complete conversation with a person with whom i have uh, you know i'm meeting regularly a person that you see in the street every day a person that you you know just say hello to every day but you you have had a conversation but you do not know that person's name and one day you realize okay i don't even know this person's name so the author realizes that she does not even know his name after months of knowing him i ask him his name sahib e alam is his name he announces he does not know what would what it means if he knew its meaning he would have a hard time believing it please underline and uh, note down the meaning of this particular part why would he have a hard time believing the meaning of his uh, the, the name why would he have a hard time uh, accepting his name he would have a hard time accepting his name because his name is sahib e alam it's a very unsuitable name it's a very inapt name why is it an inapt name it's a name it's a name which means lord of the universe the king of the universe but this king of the universe is a rag picker this child is a rag picker his parents have named him uh, sahib e alam he does not know what his name means if he knew its meaning lord of the universe he would have a hard time believing it unaware of what it means unaware of what his name means or represents he roams the streets with his friends an army of barefoot boys they look like uh, an army of barefoot boys they look like an army of barefoot boys who come in the morning they are like the morning birds they start their work very early in the morning and by noon they disappear they are done with their work whatever they have collected they would be going and selling somewhere but most of the time these children are visible in the streets in the morning and they work till noon and they keep roaming the streets barefoot they don't usually have footwear so they keep they have the rag bags on their pack on the back and they would keep running around the city i have come to recognize each of them now she knows each and every child who is a rag picker in her area she has a keen interest in knowing who they are where they come from and what do these children think moving on then one day she asks why aren't you wearing chappals i ask one boy she is talking to a group of rag picker children she asks one boy why aren't you wearing chappals again i don't think this is a very valid question this is a very good question because the child uh, does not have slippers but maybe anish jung wants to know why they are not wearing slippers is it a lack of uh, the you know is it a lack of footwear or is it that they don't like to wear slippers so she says uh, sorry the child says uh, my mother did not bring them down from the shelf what do you mean by the expression bring them down from the shelf bring them down from the shelf means the ch- mother did not buy him slippers uh, getting something off the shelf is an expression is an idiom for buying something from the shop he says that my mother did not get me slippers he she did not buy me slippers then there is another boy who says even if she did he will throw them off see he has a habit of not wearing slippers so he would have thrown his slippers off he would have thrown his chappals off even if his mother bought him slippers adds another who is wearing shoes that do not match why is this child not wearing uh, proper matching shoes he is wearing shoes that do not match with each other like say he is wearing a red shoe with a yellow yellow shoe Uh, not out of her fa- please please don't don't misunderstand it for a fashion statement like uh, the you know high high end modeling uh, sh- shows do they have very odd combinations it's not like that here he is wearing shoes that do not match because he has got these shoes from the garbage maybe he just picked these shoes from somewhere he got them in the garbage so they do not match with each other he's just wearing them and uh, when i comment on it when i comment that why are your shoes like that the child starts moving his feet he starts shuffling his feet and says nothing then there is a third child there there is a third child who says i want shoes says a third boy who has never owned a pair all his life could you understand what this child meant when he said even if she did even if 
his mother brought him shoes bought him shoes he would throw them off sometimes these poor people they don't know what to say when somebody is asking them why don't you have slippers they don't have slippers because they can't afford slippers sometimes it's difficult to say if you are not able to afford slippers so what do you do you say no i don't like to wear slippers it's not that they don't like to wear slippers it's that they are living in a constant state a perpetual state of poverty they are constantly living in such abject poverty because of which they cannot afford slippers for themselves so it's really not like they they don't like to wear slippers it's just a it's just an excuse to explain their situation like you know i go to a child and say that uh, why don't you have a phone that person will say you know because i don't like to use a phone sometimes you just explain yourself your lack your uh, depravity your your uh, you know your uh, lack of facilities of basic things by using an excuse oh i don't like to use a phone it's not like these children don't like to wear slippers they do not have slippers this is why a child is barefoot he says my mother did not buy me shoes there is another child who is wearing shoes that do not match but he is embarrassed so he is moving his feet he is constantly shuffling his feet out of embarrassment he says that you know even if he had shoes his mother even if his mother brought him shoes he would not wear shoes it's just an excuse the reality is that you are constantly poor it's that your parents cannot afford footwear for you then there is a third child who says that i would really like shoes for myself i would want shoes i really want shoes but i don't have any way of buying them okay moving on traveling across the country i have seen children walking barefoot in cities traveling across the sorry just a sec traveling across the country i have seen children walking barefoot in cities on village roads it is not lack of money but a tradition to stare barefoot is one explanation people say that it is a tradition amongst the poor to stay barefoot but in the opinion of the writer that's not the reality she says i wonder if this is only an excuse to explain away a perpetual perpetual means a continuous state of poverty she realizes that it is just an excuse that people use it's the reality is different from this excuse the reality is that they have a constant state of poverty they have a perpetual state of poverty so if you are asked this question in the exam that why do not these children the rag picker children have shoes you would say they have a perpetual state of poverty even though they use an excuse that it is a tradition to stay barefoot that they do not like to wear shoes but that's not the reality in the writer's opinion it is the perpetual state of poverty i remember a story now this is see this is not about the rag picker children but the writer is using the story here to explain something so please understand it from that point of view that anish jung has brought in this point about a priest's child to explain how it is how how generations change and how poverty gets eradicated sometimes for these rag picker children it has not happened yet but there are other people who have been able to afford shoes for their children so she tells us a tale from a place called udupi in the south of india there is a place called udupi in the south of india and there is she is narrating the story of a priest child so let's read this i remember a story a man from udupi once told me as a young boy he would go to school past an old temple where his father was a priest he would stop briefly at the temple and pray pe- for a pair of shoes that child the priest child would pray for a pair of shoes every day when he was going to school because he did not have shoes so he would pray for a pair of shoes every day he would stand in front of the temple 30 years later i visited his town and the temple which was now drowned in an air of desolation the town was not in a good condition it was a completely bleak town now desolate town now Uh, and it looked like an abandoned town in the backyard where lived the new priest there were red and white plastic chairs as a young boy and a young boy dressed in a gray uniform wearing socks and shoes 
uh, sorry, wearing socks and shoes, arrived panting, arrived running out of breath from the school and threw his school bag on a folding bed. Looking at the boy, I remember the prayer another boy had made to the goddess. When he had finally got a pair of shoes, let me never lose them, he had prayed. The goddess had granted his prayer. A prayer. Our young boys like the son of the priest now wore shoes, but many others like the rag pickers in my neighborhood remained shoeless. See, it is important that you understand this particular part of the story clearly and completely. I would like to specify that this is this story is just an example that the author is using. She says that she met a man once who told her this story that as a child he would go because he was the priest child. He was the son of a priest. So he would go to school every day. He had access to education, but he did not have shoes because when he was a child, the priests could not afford shoes. The priest, they could not afford shoes for their children. They were so poor that they could perhaps send him to a school, but they could not afford shoes for the child. So this child, the man who was narrating the story when he was a child, he would stand in front of a tem temple every day and he would pray to the goddess that I want a pair of shoes, please get, get me shoes. And uh, eventually, you know, that's what has happened. They, he got shoes, his prayer was granted, he got shoes. And he prayed that let me never lose my shoes. I want to continue wearing my shoes and I hope uh, people like me get shoes. So priest children, the sons of priests now can afford shoes. 30 years later, now from that, from when this episode ha happened to 30 years later, the author has had the chance to visit this place called Udupi. And she goes to that temple and she sees the houses attached there. She sees that the priest, there is a new priest there and the priest's house looks like a fine house now. There are red and white plastic chairs, there is a folding bed and the child, the priest child, the priest's son arrives from the school and he throws his bag on a folding bed. There is a folding bed also and he's wearing proper uniform, school uniform and proper socks and shoes. So what has happened over the years, this is the person's recollection, a person who was a priest's son once, he said that I did not have shoes, but I finally got shoes after praying so much for shoes. And nowadays, the sons of priests can afford shoes. The, you know, the economic status of a priest has changed. Today, the priest's children can afford to live in a comfortable house. They can go to school wearing a proper school uniform and proper so socks and shoes. Uh, the child of a uh, priest has access to a home that has red and white plastic chairs that has a folding bed and he is like you know just a casual child like any one of you throwing his bag on the folding bed it looks like a fine ho home now the town is not in a con good condition the priest's house is in a good condition things may have changed the prayer was granted when the uh, you know the older son son of the priest he got shoes, he made a prayer that let me never lose my shoes now. Nowadays, the sons of priests can afford shoes, but that they are in comparison, she says, in a comparison, she says that the rag pickers in my neighborhood remain shoeless. While the economic condition of the country may have improved, some sections of the country have improved, the priests can earn better money now. but. Many people still remain shoeless. For instance, the rag pickers of her neighborhood. For instance, people like Sahib -e Alam and his friends who cannot afford shoes for themselves. Uh, also, this is very ironic. I see a huge irony in this particular part of the story because the priest getting rich is a sign of something else. People are making their donations to the temples, but they, the unfortunate children are not being helped. And not that the priest and his family do not need money. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that people are improving the conditions of temples. They're making their donations, which is why a priest has uh, money now, which is why the priest child can afford shoes for himself, which is why he lives in a good house. But uh, that there is a lack of uniformity in people's donations. Sometimes people don't even care about the children roaming around the streets. If they are roaming barefoot, nobody is even bothered that they are 
roaming barefoot so there are people like sahib alam who are completely neglected in the society their condition does not improve my acquaintance my acquaintance just let me find out where it is in my story okay my acquaintance my association acquaintance means association with the barefoot rag pickers leads me to seema puri seema puri is where these people the immigrant families live uh, the illegal immigrant families live it is a place on the periphery on the border of delhi it's on the outskirts of delhi yet miles away from it metaphorically important line from the exam point of view it's a very important line metaphorically here means symbolically if you see in terms of comparison it's a place which is right at the corner of delhi right at the outskirts of delhi but delhi is the capital of the country it's a place where we, which we know for development right at the outskirts there is a place which is so underdeveloped where unprivileged underprivileged children people live where families are not even getting basic facilities so it's a place on the periphery of delhi yet miles away from it metaphorically those who live here are squatters squatters means illegal immigrants they are just here illegally from bangladesh and they came here back in 1971 sahib's family is among them sahib's family is also among them seema puri was then a wilderness wilderness is wilderness is um, a place which is Uh, you know just growing it's it's not being taken care of it's not a place which is being tended to like it's an unattended part of land where all sorts of things are just growing so it was just a complete wilderness it was not a place recognized taken care of or under anybody's uh, you know radar or under anybody's notice it was an unnoticed place just lying somewhere on the corner of the city i sometimes uh, find a rupee now we are moving on the conversation between sahib e alam and the writer move on okay sorry i think i've missed something just wait just a sec okay okay so she explains what is happening in seema puri sahib's family is also amongst these people Seema Puri was then a wilderness it still is in a way it is still a neglected place it is still a place that nobody cares about but it is no longer empty earlier it was a wilderness and it was also empty nobody lived there until these people arrived it was a wilderness it still is in structures of mud with roofs of tin and tarpaulin they do not have proper houses to live in see i was telling you that uh, it's a it's a place of neglect also these people do not have any place in any proper uh, facilities it's not they do not have proper housing there they have built mud houses and they have roofs of tin and tarpaulin it's a material that they use for roofing their houses for covering uh, covering their houses it is devoid of sewage drainage or running water imagine living in a place where there isn't running water you have to go somewhere and get water for drinking uh imagine a place where there isn't proper sewage you don't have proper toilets you don't have anything and you are living there because you're so poor and obviously you cannot claim anything because you are illegal immigrants to the city and these are approximately 10000 red red pickers there there are around 10000 people here they have lived here for more than 30 years without an identity without permission letters from the government without permits but with ration cards that get their names on the uh are uh, on the voters list and enable them to buy grain food is more important for survival than an identity please underline this particular line food is more important for survival than an identity these people choose to live here because they have nowhere else to go they might not have drainage they may, might not have uh, sewage they would not have proper food proper running water they are just trying to earn a livelihood in the city ironically they do not have an identity in the country they do not have an id card but they have a voter's id and voter's id is also an identity card only but but these people have ration card see you might uh, question this thing that ma'am 
if they have uh, ration cards then why are you saying that they don't have an identity see the point is that just because they have the ration cards does not mean they have a proper identity in the country they have ration cards because the politicians the local politicians of the area they want that they be used these people be used as voters vote vote banks for them so what they do is that they illegally get their names onto the voters list via the ration cards and it's a give and take kind of a situation see everybody knows that we have illegal immigrants in the country these illegal immigrants have nowhere to go nowhere else to go nobody takes their responsibility so the local politicians of the area they want them to be used as vote banks they uh, they get them cheap rations they get them cheap grains through the ration cards ration cards get their names onto the voters list when they have uh, the voters list they when they have their names on the voters list they are able to vote and cast their vote so see it's a vicious cycle but the important part to understand when i say they don't have a proper identity card i am not saying they don't have ration cards i am not saying they don't they don't have an identity card that is legal they don't have identity that is stable identity in the country everybody knows they are illegal immigrants to the country so only to get cheap grains they have a ration card and only to give their vote to the politicians who is uh, you know who's making it possible for them they have their names on the voters list otherwise they don't have any other rights in the country they don't have uh, any other rights in the terms that they they are not counted as citizens in any way other than this like you know just being able to give a vote is not being counted as a citizen what is the country doing for you and also you are illegal immigrants here the country of your origin does not take your responsibility the country that you are here uh, living in that does not take your responsibility so it's a it's a complete grip of poverty that these people are caught in and seema puri used to be as i specified it used to be a wilderness it used to be an abandoned vegetation that nobody was bothered about these people came and settled down here even though there are no facilities they are living in houses of mud with roofs which are cheap material they are living here because they have nowhere else to go and gold in the city here is their livelihood rag picking has become their livelihood so moving on you know how the politicians are just making use of them without giving them their proper status okay food is more important for survival than an identity of course what would you do with an identity if you do not have food if at the end of the day we can feed our families and go to bed without an aching stomach we would rather live here than in the fields that gave us no grain say a group of women in tattered sarees in torn sarees when i asked them why they left their beautiful land of green fields and rivers wherever they find food they pitch their tents that become transit home temporary homes children grow up in them becoming partners in survival and survival in seema puri means rag picking all of the lines of this chapter you know they are from the exam point of view they are all important because see see you know they can be asking you questions from any part for instance they might ask you that why do the women say this there is a group of women that uh, the author meets in seema puri she visits seema puri to meet these families and anis jung finds that people people are living in abject poverty there and she talks to a group of women that why would you leave your beautiful lands in dhaka and be settled here in india as illegal immigrants why would you do that so they say that if at the end of the day we can feed our families and go to bed without an empty stomach aching stomach means uh, an empty stomach a starving stomach we would rather live here than in the fields that that, get, that gave us no grain so what do you do with an identity in dhaka bangladesh where they were the legal citizens they were the legal uh, people there the uh, you know the rightful owners of the place but they did not have food to eat which is why they chose to migrate to india so that they can find some li livelihood in the city so they would choose to live here get grains get food instead of being in dhaka and 
the women's sari is also you would see that the clothes are also tattered they are torn sarees that they are wearing and they left the beautiful green fields for the same reason that they did not have food there wherever they find food they pitch their tents that become transit homes these people are used to living a transitional life all the time transit means temporary changing all the time they pitch their tents wherever there is a possibility of finding a livelihood simapuri is where they found a livelihood because they live there they have pitched themselves there their tents are there now they go to the city and rag pick every day so it has become a livelihood for them underline this line children grow up in them becoming partners in survival how do you become partners in survival because these children struggle together say they come from similar poverty they come from similar uh, situations so these children they rag pick together and they become one together they become, they they feel togetherness via their poverty the and also survival in sima puri just means rag picking they are partners in survival they survive together they have learned to survive together in the city in the capital of the country in a foreign land but at the same time they know that rag picking is their gold in the city rag picking is their main source of livelihood so sima puri survival in sima puri is just rag picking that's what they can do they do not have any other options here but some options can open like it happens with sahib e alam towards the end of the story that he starts working at a tea stall but the point is that those options are also exploitative options that are available to them at least rag picking gives them that option of roaming around freely what do you do see you are as a rag picker you are more like a freelancer sadly but in a way this is the comparison that fits that you can you earn as much as you can for that particular day but nobody is actually your master nobody is your boss because you are picking garbage you're roaming around so it is in a kind it is in a way a kind of freedom also but uh, if you start working as a tea stall worker you don't have the same freedom so sahib e alam towards the end of the story we'll see that he has transitioned into a tea stall worker where he is being given some extra things which he does not get in as a rag picker but the point is that he is no longer his own master he has given his freedom he has sold his freedom in exchange of some basic things through the years it has acquired the proportions of a fine art what has become a fine art for these people for the rag pickers see the last line that we read on the previous slide they have become partners in survival and survival in sima puri means rag pickings the only way of surviving in sima puri is to become a rag picker and through the years the business of rag picking the the whole job of rag picking every day it has acquired the proportions of a fine art fine art is something that you have perfected like it's an art it's a creative process that you have uh, perfected she is saying it ironically that it has become almost like a professional art for them now they these people started rag picking these immigrants started rag picking because they had no other way of earning a livelihood but now since they have been doing it for so many years because the children have also learned the art from them they have become almost like pro at it they have become professional rag pickers almost it has acquired the proportions of a fine art garbage to them is gold again a reference where we have garbage being compared to gold she is calling garbage gold because it is the main source this it is their main source of livelihood their main stay it is their daily bread a roof over their heads even if it is a leaking roof even if it means a leaking roof it is a roof at least they get something they might not be getting amazing luxuries out of rag picking but at least they get something out of it so they they have a roof over their heads even if it is a leaking roof so rag picking is important to them you cannot deny that you cannot say that rag picking does not mean anything or oh, what what is rag picking rag picking has some importance in these people's lives it has been able to give them food but for a child it is even more sometimes garbage is gold to the elders because they want survival and uh, food out of it for children rag picking has a different dimension also that it can be more of a wonder wonder uh, you know wrapped activity 
you are roaming around with the the group of boys every day you are children together and you are roaming around and you have your own freedom so rag picking has a meaning other than uh, other uh, something something else for the children than what it means for the parents for the child it is even more i sometimes find a rupee even a 10 rupee note sahib says his eyes lighting up when you can find the silver coin in a heap of garbage you don't stop scrounging you don't stop searching for there is hope of finding more these children sometimes get very excited even if they find one rupee note or a two rupee note or a 10 rupee note in the garbage and sometimes the you know the whole idea of uh, just keep looking for things it becomes a kind of game for the children they like it because it is a lot of freedom they like it because they can sometimes find things that are completely unexpected like finding money in the garbage is not something that you expect but once you found a rupee once you found a silver coin you always feel that you can find more there is an excitement that goes on so for their parents it just means survival but for children it is also a you know an activity which has a lot of wonder they have they wander about they keep looking for things and they sometimes find things that they were not expecting in the garbage it seems that for children the garbage has a meaning different from what it means for the children for the children it is wrapped in wonder for the elders it is a means of survival underline this line for the children it is wrapped in wonder for the parents it is a means of survival one winter morning i see sahib standing by the fenced gate of the neighborhood club watching two young men dressed in white playing tennis i like the game he hums content to watch he is quite satisfied to watch the game of tennis standing behind the fence i go inside when no one he is around he admits the gatekeeper lets me use the swing so this is another morning this is another morning when she sees sahib standing outside a tennis court and uh, there are people playing tennis and he's just looking at the game he admits it to the uh, author to the writer anil jang that i really like the game of tennis obviously he is not he does not have the capacity he does not have the you know he does not have the background that he can play tennis but obviously he can look at the game of tennis sometimes the gatekeeper even lets him use the swing that is inside the garden so he is very happy in his own limited joys he is very happy that uh, the gatekeeper gives him this luxury of using a swing there which he never thought he could get so he is happy in his limited joys he knows he cannot reach the game of tennis it's a t- t- it's a game that's meant for the rich people for well to do pe- people who can you know even he like even if he likes it he does not have the reach to the game i like the game he hums content he is completely content to watch it he is completely satisfied watching it standing behind the fence i go inside when no one is looking whenever i am alone here i just go inside the gatekeeper lets me use the swing sahib too is wearing tennis shoes the author notices that even sahib is wearing new shoes earlier sahib did not have shoes he was uh, barefoot but now he is wearing new tennis shoes new looking not new obviously they are discarded shoes he is wearing tennis shoes shoes that look strange over his discolored shirt and shorts see tennis shoes are usually white and uh, he is wearing uh, tennis shoes that look completely out of place with the clothes that he is wearing he is wearing torn clothes his we- clothes are like rags they are looking like completely uh, discolored pieces that he is wearing and he is wearing shoes with them which look out of place of course the fact that they are discarded shoes of some rich boy who perhaps refused to wear them because of a hole in one of them does not bother him the fact that these shoes that he is wearing are somebody's discarded shoes somebody's rejected shoes that you and i won't wear does not bother him when you are so poor when you don't have anything in your life even somebody's rejected shoes somebody's discarded shoes somebody's shoes with a hole do not bother you you feel that it is a great treasure for you that somebody has given you he he sees them as a great prize for himself he does not see it as a rejected pair of shoes because of a hole of in one of them somebody refused to wear them for one who has walked barefoot even shoes with a hole is a dream come true if you have not had shoes ever in your life even torn shoes are 
great achievement. But the game he is watching so intently with so much attention is out of his reach. He can get somebody's rejected tennis shoes. He has got the tennis shoes. But he has no reach to the game. He has no way of playing that game which is meant for the rich people. So rejected tennis shoes does not warrant, do not warrant that he would also get a chance to play the game. He can get inside when no one is looking. He can go to the garden where people are playing tennis. When no one is looking, when no one is there, he can get inside and also sit in a swing because the gatekeeper is generous towards him, the gatekeeper is kind towards him. But playing tennis, that's not in his reach. That would never happen because he is a poor child. This morning, this is another morning. Now we have moved towards the end of the story. This is another morning. This morning, Sahib is on his way to the milk booth. In his hand is a steel canister, a steel container. I now work in a tea stall down the road, he says, pointing in a distance. He tells the author that uh, I work there now. I work at that tea stall. I am paid 800 rupees and all my meals. He is getting better money than he got as a rag picker. He, he has got a job. He has, he has progressed. He has got a job at a tea stall. He is no longer a rag picker only. So he is getting 800 rupees and he is also being given meals at that particular shop. Does he like the job? The author asks him. I ask. His face has lost, has, has lost the carefree look. The, can, the steel canister seems heavier than the plastic bag he would carry so lightly on his shoulder. The bag was his. The canister belongs to the man who owns the tea shop. Sahib is no longer his own master. What a beautiful end to the story. Uh, he is no longer the master of his universe. See, earlier we pointed out that uh, his name is sahib alam the lord of the universe, but he's a poor rag picker. So it's an ironical name for a person. It's such an unsuitable name for a poor person that he's called lord of the universe, but he's a poor rag picker. Here, you see that even though he did not own the universe, he was not a rich person, but at least he had his own freedom as, as a rag picker. Even that freedom is gone now. Why? Because he wants this 800 rupees per month and he wants all of the meals. It's a progress for him from a rag picker to this. But what has happened in the, in the, in the bargain? He has lost his freedom. He has lost uh, the, you know, the freedom of being, for, being with this uh, group of friends roaming around the streets, finding a rupee or a two rupee or a ten rupee sometimes and just being being himself. He, he has lost his joys of childhood completely. It is exactly lost spring for him because now he is a slave to the tea stall person. He may be called a chotu or anybody at the tea stall. He has lost his identity completely because he is working at a tea stall as a slave now. He, he has to work, he has to work throughout the day, he has to carry out the duties throughout the day. He is no longer free to be with his own people to run around the streets. So he is no longer his own master. Even though he has got 800 rupees and all his meals. See, for a poor person, for his meals being covered in a job, it's a great achievement. If you are a poor person and you can, you somebody gives you a job where you are also being covered for your meals, it's a great achievement for you because you are not able to afford those meals otherwise. Sometimes you even go you know, uh, hungry at night. You do not have food in the house. But here he has got, got all those things. He got a job finally like that. But he is not happy. His face has lost the carefree look. He looks sad. He looks depressed. He is not looking like the child that the author met earlier. The happy rag picker. Okay, so this was uh, where we, this is where we end this story. This is the st where the story ends rather. And we shall continue with this chapter, with the second story in our next lecture, lecture, num lecture number 9. And when we do lecture number 9, we will do questions in totality. We'll do all those NCRT questions and extra questions in the next lecture. In the meantime, please take care and keep revising. Thanks so much. This is Ambika Singh signing off. Bye.